sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Good morning and welcome to Quispam Cis United Church. It's been such a long time since we've been together. It's nice to see you all and folks on Zoom. Do we have an idea who's with us on Zoom this morning? Ten people on Zoom. So welcome everybody as we light the Christ's candle. Let's think on these words. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world, a light that shines in our deepest darkness. May you shine in our hearts with a light that never fades. We give you thanks and praise, O Christ of endless light. I'll invite Carolyn to come and give us our welcome this morning. light this candle lit from the flame of Christ's own light and love. As we proclaim ourselves as the community where all people are invited without barriers based on age, gender, race, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, different abilities, ethnic background, or economic circumstance. We celebrate the richness that diversity brings to our church, even as it challenges us to walk down roads we have not yet traveled. We pray for God's spirit to guide us as we work for reconciliation and justice for all persons in both church and society. Acknowledgement of Territories. As we gather to worship, let us pause to remember that in this region, we live and work and worship on lands that are by law, the unceded territories of the Wabanaki people, predominantly the lands of the Mi'kmaq, 
schools, Quay, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its people. Miigwech. Do we have anything to celebrate this morning? Other than the fact that we're back together, it's been four weeks since we've seen one another, so surely there must have been some celebrations in our midst. Today is Heather's birthday. Today is Heather's birthday. She's 29. <laughs> 37. Wow. Anything else? Yes. That's good. <laughs> Any other celebrations? Well, we will celebrate after service with lemonade and cookies, I'm told. So if you have a chance to come down after service and join in that celebration, you are most welcome to do so. Let's join together in this morning's call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. Come, all you are hungry. And would you join with me, please, in the prayer of approach? Holy wisdom, you granted Solomon's request for an understanding mind and the knowledge to discern good from evil. Fill us with such understanding and knowledge that we may act as instruments of your loving desire for creation, working with you to transform our conceit into concern for others, our fear into love, our violence into peace, and our brokenness into wholeness. Amen. Let's join our voices in song in this morning's opening hymn, There's a Spirit in the Air, Voices United, 582. It's seven verses, so get some good breath. <laughs>
Thank you. You may be seated. Would you join with me this morning's prayer of confession? Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, we come, yet we know we come with doubts and fears. We know we come in ignorance. We know that we have failed you, your creation, and your people in many ways. Trusting in your love, we turn again to you as we open our hearts to your mercy and forgiveness. Grant us your peace. After hearing the news about Jesus' resurrection, the disciples were afraid and hid behind closed doors. Huddled in the dark, they waited, unsure of what to do next. Into fear and doubt, Jesus brought a message of peace and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Encounters with Jesus never leave us where they found us. Jesus calls each of us to a new life. His death and resurrection forgives us, reshapes us, and renews us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So, time for all ages. We have a couple of children with us. I'll let them stay with their parents and I'll just speak from the pulpit this morning. So, the title that I gave this was, Say What? And it talks about a bit of a misunderstanding that we might see in today's scripture lessons. So imagine, if you will, Jesus is talking to a crowd of people, and he finishes off his big speech by saying, so there you have it. I'm the bread of life. If you want to live forever, you have to eat my body. Well, the crowd was a little bit confused about this. And one of them said, no way. How am I supposed to eat a body? And someone else said, oh, that's not OK at all. People are not supposed to eat other people. And they were muttering and complaining. This one child who had been listening very carefully snuck up behind Jesus and bit him on the leg. Ouch, said Jesus. Somebody bit me. Jesus looked down, and there was a little boy, probably about the age of our girls here today, and he had a mischievous grin on his face. What are you doing down there, Jesus said, stepping back. Jesus was smiling. He wasn't really mad, but he didn't want to get bitten again. Well, you said we had to eat your body, said the boy. And when we have chicken, I always like the legs best. <laughs> well, Jesus laughed. He said, well, I think, you know, I'd better explain this just a little bit more. He said, I told you I'm the bread of life and you need to eat me, but you can't just pull parts off me for dinner or chomp on my leg. It's a word picture. I want you to compare me with ordinary bread. And the little boy still looked a bit confused. What do you mean compare? Okay, said Jesus. Well, let's take it step by step. What do you do with bread? Eat it, said the little boy. Right, said Jesus. Now, why do you eat it? Well, because I'm hungry, said the boy. Right again, said Jesus. Now, what would happen if you didn't eat your bread? Like maybe you didn't have any breakfast, or you didn't eat any lunch, and you didn't have any supper. I'd be miserable, said the boy. Well, what else? What if you still don't eat your bread on the next day? Well, I'll probably get weak and sick. Maybe I'd die, said the boy. Right, said Jesus. You're very bright. If you don't eat your bread, you'll get hungry. Eventually, you would starve. I'm saying you need to think of me the same way. When you feel empty inside and you're hungry for joy, what you really need is more of me. You? Me, said Jesus. If you don't have me, you're going to get hungry and weak, not in your body, but in your spirit. 
But if you have me, I'll fill you up with life, and that life will last forever. But how am I supposed to eat you? So Jesus looked at the little boy, and he remembered how hard it is for kids to understand word pictures. So he whispered in the boy's ear, I'll tell you something that all these grown-ups won't know for quite some time. I'm going to teach all my friends how to eat my body. When we're all at dinner one night, I'm going to take a loaf of bread, and I'm going to say, this bread is my body. Eat this bread, and you will have me inside you. I'll fill you up. I'll give you life forever. And that's what we do in our church every time we have communion. The minister takes the bread, lifts it up, and says the words of Jesus. This is my body, broken for you. Take it and eat it, and remember me. She has also set her table. She has set out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. The gospel reading is John 6, 51 to 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give you is the life of the world of my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up to the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me down, and I have, be and because I live of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
What a treat. And here we are to worship. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you, Bob. Wow. Goosebumps. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the tapestry of the human experience, the significance of food extends beyond the realm of mere sustenance. It's a thread that weaves throughout our celebrations, connecting the dots of joy, of sorrow, and everything in between. And while nourishment is undeniably vital for our physical well being, there exists a profound relationship between food and our emotions. Just ask the tub of ice cream in my freezer. The evolution of the human nutrition traces a fascinating journey from primal instincts of survival to a nuanced art of celebrating all of life's joys and sorrows. Food is a universal language deeply embedded in our social fabric. Food plays diverse and intricate roles in shaping our daily lives, our beliefs, our socioeconomics. And the tradition of indulging in delicious and special foods during celebrations is deeply rooted. Across various cultures and festivals, food has emerged as an occasion to not only celebrate, but express our identity, our heritage, our communal bonds, all of this through culinary experiences. Food serves a vital tool in establishing and expressing relationships within our society. And sharing a meal is a universal way of fostering social bonds. Our celebrations often involve coming together with family and friends, and food becomes central and facilitates this connection. And whether it's shared in a group setting, during religious ceremonies, or through daily interactions, food becomes a means for people to connect and express relationship with others. So the importance of food can't be overstated. Food plays important roles in our mental well-being, whether it's during birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, or just because. And most celebrations really aren't celebrations unless the table is adorned with food. It seems we have a desire for a feast to aid our celebrations. This morning's reading from Proverbs 
Wisdom prepares a feast for all to attend who wish to learn. It's an invitation to wisdom. And that invitation is given through the personification of wisdom as a woman who has built a house, prepared a life-giving meal, and invited everyone to partake. The description of wisdom's meal paints a picture of a true feast in a lavish, sacred setting. And in the opening verses that Carolyn read to us, we heard that wisdom has built her own house and that this construction involved setting up seven pillars. Now, in the time, pillars would only be used in building a house of a substantial size and quality. And the number seven implies that some special character is in this house. Perhaps the number seven is a reference to the mythic pillars of the foundation of the earth, especially as wisdom's role in creation was emphasized in the passages that we see before the one we read today. The number also may suggest the pillars of a temple. But both ideas may indeed fit together, picking up a common scriptural idea of the whole of earth being God's temple. Now the meal itself and the invitation likewise indicate the rich and open nature of this feast. Wisdom has slaughtered multiple animals and set a table, indicating that this meal was going to go beyond the everyday meals of the average Israelite as the typical meal for the average person in the Asian world did not involve meat. Bread and wine were also to be served. And wisdom has servant girls. She is a woman of means, clearly, and she sent them out to issue an invitation to a rich feast to which all are invited. And in wisdom's own words, we hear that the food and the drink that she prepares are metaphors for a banquet of life and partaking in that meal that she has laid out for us is connected with walking on a straight path to understanding. We find wisdom in this morning's New Testament in the understanding of Christ and the connection between wisdom and creation is a significant part of the foundation for our understanding of Christ's pre-existence and the involvement in creation as it appears, especially in John's Gospel. Now, the Gospel of John is the last written of the four biographies of, excuse me, of the four biographies of Jesus that have been preserved for the New Testament. Written by a Christian named John, the contents of the book indicate clearly that the author was not John of the Apostles. For it contains no direct personal references of the type that one would expect from an intimate association with Jesus. On the contrary, it represents an interpretation of Jesus that reflects ideas and situations that prevailed in the Christian community towards the end of the first century of the Christian era and a time when Christianity was under attack from several different quarters, including the Jews, Romans, skeptics, and others making charges against it. The author of the Gospel of John was evidently aware of these attacks and knew that some of the accounts given in the earlier Gospels were interpreted in a manner that seemed to support these charges. But because he also believed so firmly in a new Christian movement, he wanted to write a Gospel that set forth its essential truth in the best possible way. His hope was that he might, run, might write one that was not only true, but that offered a presentation of the Christian faith that would overcome the, object, the objections of the critics and gain respect of the educated and cultured people of that day. 
So this objective helps us as well to understand many of the unique characteristics of John's gospel. It explains the omission in the gospel of John of the many items found in earlier accounts. And it also explains, at least in part, the different attitude about Jews and the allegorical interpretations of certain miracle stories. So we might be led to believe then that the purpose of this gospel, as stated by John himself, is to so that Jesus of Nazareth was Christ, the Son of God, and that believers in him might have eternal life. The central theme in the previous Gospels is the coming of the kingdom of God. And it was in relation to this event that the accounts were given of the life of Jesus and his teachings. The messianic character of Jesus' mission was described in terms of miracles that he performed, his kindly attitude toward the poor and the oppressed, and his power to cast out demons and to heal the sick, and his instructions concerning the way people should live in view of the imminence of the coming kingdom. But the genius of today's gospel lies in the way which John conceives of the relationship between the human and the divine. This relationship has always been a problem that has puzzled people. How can God who is conceived as an eternal, omniscient, and omnipotent being, have any direct contact with that which is temporal, changing, and limited by the conditions of space and time. In other words, how can divinity ever be united with humanity unless one becomes involved in a contradiction of terms? John answers this question in this statement. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So this morning's verses from John constitute the ending of the bread of life discourses given at the synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus' hometown as an adult. The discourse follows the stories of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. But this week's passage is the most visceral of the Bread of Life series. Any spiritual gloss set aside, Jesus is talking about the very human activity of eating and drinking. The elements themselves are described crudely in nine verses, Jesus uses the word flesh seven times, the word blood four times, and it's exactly as bad as it sounds. The Jewish annotated New Testament notes that the literal meaning is not only repellent, but it's offensive. The Greek word sarx is used and could well be translated as hamburger. To think of communion like this is a little bit challenging. More than one celebrant of communion has a story of a child really hearing the words of institution and responding with, ew, gross. The Jews in John's gospel aren't the only ones who dispute this text among themselves. It seems that Luther didn't like it either, at least not as his, on his sermons of John 6. This cannot be applied to the sacrament, Luther writes. This is not the sort of flesh from red, which red sausages are made. Luther admits that he is directing his sermon against the Arians and sacramentarians and other schismatic spirits and fanatics. So perhaps we can forgive a reading that is so contrary to a plain meaning of the text. And the fact that Jesus delivers this message in his hometown makes it especially difficult for listeners to accept his words because they are provocative 
and there are claims that appear to be exaggerated. Jesus' neighbors ask him for a validating sign and mention Moses' gift of manna in the desert as an example. Jesus corrects them. It wasn't Moses who gave you, notice the past tense, the bread out of heaven, but my Father gives you, notice the present tense, the true bread out of heaven. And then he goes on to identify himself as the bread of life. Jesus' listeners complain about his apparent grandiosity. How can this local boy, their neighbor, claim to be bread from heaven? How can his father give them the true bread from heaven? They know his father, Joseph, an ordinary carpenter, not a baker of heavenly bread. Well, Jesus responds by making even bolder claims. The Israelites ate manna in the wilderness, but the manna sustained their lives for only a few years, and they died out long ago. In contrast, Jesus claims to be the living bread, which came down out of heaven, and anyone who eats of this bread will live forever. Yes, the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Well, it's no wonder that the listeners found this difficult. Jesus said that eating his body and drinking his blood allows his followers to abide in him and he in them. Praying the Lord's Prayer, partaking in communion, being Christian people, these are all group projects. The living bread of heaven came down from heaven into the realities of human life. So we, as followers of Christ, must also be willing to come down from our lofty ideals and enter the messiness, the offensiveness of human need. In the journey toward eternal life, the temporal cannot be swept aside. If we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it reminds us that it is only when our baser requirements are supplied that can, we can realize greater goals. We are not satisfied with the bread our ancestors ate. We long for something more, for good jobs, a workable Wi-Fi, first responders, a world where, in Luther's words, Good government, good weather, peace, health, decency, honor, good friends, and faithful neighbors are the common good of all. Eating the living bread of heaven, Jesus' own flesh and blood, is only offensive when looked at in isolation. His vision of abiding together changes everything our daily bread given by God, shared in a community, it's paradise. It's a collage of hope. How are you? It's a common question, one that we ask and are asked every day. And you and I both know the standard answers. Fine, I'm doing well, things are really busy right now, I'm good. And sometimes we wonder, are we trying to convince ourselves or others? And I suspect I'm not the only one who's had this type of conversation with folk. Most of us have these several times a day. We offer the usual answers. Sometimes you might add something about our family and our health, where we've been or what we've been doing. And more often than not, the questions will focus on the circumstances of life. We might be fine and busy, getting our work done, meeting our deadlines and commitments, fulfilling our obligations, volunteering our time, loving and caring for our families. 
But there's a difference, a vast difference between doing life and having life within us. Doing life or having life, that's the issue that Jesus is concerned about. And that's the focus of today's gospel. It's important enough that it's been the subject of the last several Sundays of gospel readings. Each week has brought us closer to the unspoken question behind today's gospel. Is there life within you? Jesus is talking about more than just physical or biological life. He's talking about a life that's beyond words, that's indescribable, and yet we know it when we taste it. And we get a taste of it when we love so deeply and so profoundly that everything about us dies, passes away, and somehow we are more fully alive than we ever were before. Sometimes everything seems to fit together perfectly and all is right with the world, not because we got our way, but because we knew ourself to be a part of something larger, more beautiful and more holy than anything we could have done. We were tasting life. There are moments when time stands still and we wish that moment would never end. And in that moment, we are in the flow, the wonder and the unity of life. And it tastes good. Jesus is our medicine, our health. He is our life and the means to the life for which we deeply hunger. We don't work for the life we want. We eat the life we want. Wherever human hunger and the flesh and blood of Christ meet, there is life. In the eating and drinking of Christ's flesh and blood, he lives in us and we live in him. We consume his life that he might consume and change our own. We eat and digest his life, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, his way of being, his way of seeing, his compassion, his presence, and his relationship with the Creator. We eat and drink our way to life. So my friends, leave nothing behind, push nothing to the side, clean your plate. Amen. Let's once again join our voices in song as we sing the hymn, Break Now the Bread of Life, Voices United, 501. Oh, 
You may be seated. I commend the announcements that were sent out this week to your attention that speak of the life and the work of our church. And I know we're just newly back, but are there any announcements from you folk? Hi, everyone. Are we on, Bruce? Yep. Uh, so this week was Pride Week here in St. John, and I'm thrilled to just announce and let you know uh, Chris Pampsis United Church had uh, quite a lot of involvement. Last Sunday, as some of you know and attended, we had our Pride service at Harmony United. Thank you to the people that bought squares and cookies. There was more food than we could eat, and a lot of it went to Romero House, thanks to Doug McDonald. Uh, however, it was a very powerful service and the guest speaker was a Navy veteran who was trans and who spoke about their journey uh, in the Navy and also coming back uh, and being um, home in Canada and uh, just a very powerful message and it made me realize that we have so much work to do. Yesterday was Pride Parade and uh, there was four churches represented. Um, which was fantastic. And I want to share with you just one small thing. So Reverend Kate Jones and Reverend Jen Broomhead both wore their, their um, robes and their collars. And um, they had signage as well. And one of Kate's signs was, God loves all their children. And it was phenomenal to see how many people came up and said, Minister, can I have a photo with you? People are longing for God. People are longing to belong. People are longing to be seen in the presence of God. So our work is yet begun. Thank you, Sue. Any other? Okay, so we're on to sharing of our gifts and our talents. We had talents this morning with Bob and Amelia, and we share our gifts. And if you notice in this week's bulletin, we're a little bit in the red as a deficit. So uh, please share your gifts abundantly. And for all that we do in our talents and in our financial offerings, let us sing our dedication to this for the gift of creation. prayer. Gracious God, accept our offerings, accept our worship, accept us through your love shown to us, given to us in Jesus Christ who came, who is with us, and who will come again. Amen. Let's once again come before God in prayer as we give our intercessions, prayers for people and others. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the blessings of life. We bless you for the wonders of the world, for the heights of the mountains, the breadth of the prairie, for the diversity of people 
for the intimacy of family, for the goodness of all you have made. We bless you for the gift of Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lives again, wherever justice is known, wherever love is found. We bless you for your life among us, forgiving sins, renewing spirits, and refreshing us in the fellowship of your table. Grant, O oh God, that in the quietness of evening and in the hush of night, our hearts may be filled with thankfulness for all of these, these things and your blessings. Mighty and tender God, hear us as we pray, for you bring release to the captives and rest to the weary, and you know the way of suffering in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so today, we pray for the church throughout the world in its life and its ministries. For nations as they strive for peace and justice. For all who suffer, the sick, the sorrow, the lonely, the oppressed. And today we especially pray for the Smith family, for Arlene and Ken, for Pam and Peg. We offer prayers for Hillary and Barb, for Sharon, for Kyle and Jeff, for Archie, for Judy, we raise to you Sheila and Greg, Carol and Leslie, Roger, Bill and Rachel, Paul and Pat, and each and every one of us worshiping with us today. We pray for peaceful relationships among all of our friends and among strangers. Tender and mighty God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes as we bind them all together in the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Amen. Let us raise our voices one last time in song as we sing this morning's closing in, Guide me thou, O great Jehovah, Voices United, 651. i 
strength and cheer. May thou still my strength and Eternal God, you call us to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and forevermore. Amen. Thank you to Bruce, thank you to the members of the choir, thank you to Bob and Amelia, thank you to Angela, thank you to Leslie, and thank you all for coming this morning. Don't forget, lemonade and cookies downstairs. <laughs>